All right, everyone, before we jump into today's video, uh, this was a podcast recorded in Colorado with Reese Johnson. Uh, he hunts in Kentucky and does a ton of different unique trail camera sets, and we talk all about it. And he also said he was the creator of Trail Cam Tuesday. We got back to the office, did some digging, and he's close. He's the sixth person to use it on Twitter. Um, three other people used it on July 2nd along with him. He was the last one of that day. So regardless, anyways, if you haven't subscribed already, please go ahead and do that and make sure to hit the like button if you do enjoy this video. Thanks. Lights, camera, follow the trail. Ready to shoot. If you know where a deer's bedding and you know where he's eating, that deer should be dead. Camera. If you're passive on a deer, what you're doing is you're teaching. I've got 30 bucks in the Michigan record book. Everyone but one has had at least one previous wound on his body. Some had as many as four. <laughs> Trail Cam Radio from the guys at Exodus. All right, we are live uh, with another episode of Trail Cam Radio, and this is probably the coolest set we have had out of 60 some episodes. We are in Colorado. I don't know what mountain name that is. There's about I'm a thousand mountains around right here. <laughs> no idea. Um, so I'm sitting down with Reese Johnson, and for people who don't know you, just real quick before we get into everything else, who are you? Where are you from? And what do you do for a living to take off 10 days to come to yourself? <laughs> yeah. So um, I live in western Kentucky, uh, just out of Paducah. And so that is uh, where we've lived for the last, I guess we're pushing 15 years now. Bounced around a bunch when I was a kid. We lived in Georgia, Mississippi, Arkansas. That's where I was born, all over the southeast. And then went to school in Missouri and came back home. Kentucky's now home. And so that's where we've been and really grown, um, I guess you'd say, in the whitetail and hunting. You know, that's what we love. I think everybody here that's listening thinks the same. Um, and then what allows me to do this is I'm a real estate broker, uh, land specialist, whatever you want to say or call it, real estate agent, which gives me that flexibility uh, to do, to do uh, I guess, take my own vacation more or less. I work for myself, and so... To some degree, and and uh, that gives me that freedom. And that's with Keller Williams, right? Yes, I'm with Keller Williams Land. Um, work for Keller Williams Experience Realty at Paducah office, and I'm the uh, the land specialist out of the out of that office. And I do, uh, I'd say, 50% residential, 50% land, farm, um, a lot of hunting property, and then a handful of commercial pieces over here and there throughout time. Gotcha. So someone's looking for something in Western Kentucky here that got a call. Yeah, yeah, that is that would be me. So this is day seven of our elk hunt, and just a quick <laughs> that may be interested. We have been struggling, um, and we've also been hunting hard. I think. Yeah. We have we've been semi discouraged, but I think we've also just have kept the hammer down for the most part. And the elk have not been talking whatsoever. Um, they like i cannot confirm we've heard a real bugle this entire trip at this point yeah it's tough to say i think we were pretty um naive the first day or two and not realizing how many people were out in the woods and when we heard something thinking it was a real bugle yeah um but then <laughs> quickly quickly learned that yeah they probably weren't legitimate bugles yeah um, so we've bounced around from the state a decent amount we've bounced spots we've gone to different places where people suggested and a lot of old sign, a lot of just being a week or two behind, and <laughs> yeah, we're we're a week behind the archery opener, and yeah. that pushed a lot of elk, put a lot of pressure on them. So all that sign we're finding is a week or two old, and those elk have been bumped, and they're not bugling, which has made it much much harder and much awesome. less romantic than we anticipated or hoped it would be. Yeah, we came out here, fired off bugling every hundred yards, and <clears throat> we quickly quickly forgot that. Yeah, and that. It's different. <laughs> it's so frustrating. Uh, just, I know. Just having. Uh, the only yeah. thing I can compare it to is hunting in a national forest or a state ground, big chunks of hardwoods back east, and turkeys not gobbling. I mean, yeah. that's kind of like, well, if you find a sign, you find somewhere to sit down. If they're not, if they're not talking, you can't chase them. You can't. Well, it's not very fun. Like it's only. No, it is not made this. Talking, and that's where we've done our best to try to get onto something, but it has not happened yet. So there's cold front rolling in. Um, probably when this goes live, so we're hoping to catch maybe just them being fired up for a day yeah, or two. Yeah. We're, we're on the home stretch. We're running out of time. Yeah, we're on the home stretch. We've seen everything but an elk at this point. An elk and a mountain lion is the only thing we haven't seen yet. Yeah, we've run into the rest. So, 
although we've been on an elk hunt, we've pretty much been talking white tails, <laughs> whether it was driving or uh, walking out there saying like naturally would, you know, <laughs> feeling very excited for white tail season. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And how, first off, how was your 2018 season? So 2018, 2018 was a heck of a year for me. Um, that was almost, I mean, I'll probably maybe never top that year. So I, I shot two deer, um, both over 150. Um, so it was kind of, it's kind of odd. I hunted very hard in my home state of Kentucky. Uh, pretty fortunate, pretty blessed. We got a lot of good ground, public or private ground. And then, and so I hunted pretty hard there. And oddly enough, of all the days and all the, time I spent in the tree there chasing a couple of particular deer I was after never did feel that tag and so my first trip of the year was to uh hunt with my buddy Alex Lang in Missouri <clears throat> and uh hunted two days there and of course the big deer he was chasing walked out in front of me that second morning as it always goes and we we green scored that deer at 177 and uh so that was that was the deer that he was after of course and you know he put me in the in the he was in the good spot, and, and I would have been as well. And then, of course, that deer come chasing doe by me that second morning, and it ended that. And so that one was me, and then I, I rushed back home, actually, to try to hunt the deer that I had been chasing, and I left to go chase, in, or left to go to Missouri and hunt. And I'd been hunting him hard. Um, I'd seen him three different times. I had a bow, couldn't get him close enough, you know, 75 to 100 yards every time. And so I rushed back home. That was t gun season open Saturday. I got home on Tuesday, hopped in the tree Wednesday. That afternoon, the neighbor shot him. And that deer scored 164. And that was a four-year-old that I'd had uh, three years of history with. We'd been watching for quite some time. And that was one I had my eye on. So that really, that really hurt. And then you killed another one somewhere. In there yep, yep. So we, we do a public land quota hunt um, yearly, um, me and my dad and uh, a couple friends here and there and we went up there and um, he shot one um, he shot one the first morning then I shot one the, the second morning and um, they were both in the 150s um, and so that was a uh, and that was those deer there that's just I mean a lot of that's luck but you know you're reading terrain reading sign going in there and so so I had a pretty solid year um, I was trying to complete the trifecta and come home and, and, and get that other deer. And of course, I hunted the rest of the year all the way into January and never did fill my Kentucky buck tag. And I let a lot of deer go that, you know, I could you could say I'd regret now or might might should have shot. But but uh, overall, it's going to be tough to beat 2018. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely say that. <laughs> I mean, um, well, I guess rolling into 2019, I mean, you've been running trail cameras. Oh, yeah. All summer, how as of right now, how does 2019 look? I know in 20, Kentucky has been, yeah. been hit with the HD. And yeah, you have checked your cameras since. Pretty worried, honestly. I'm seeing a lot, of, seeing a lot of um, dead deer floating around on on social media. Um, we've we fought that battle in the past. We've kind of gotten a break over the last four or five years, and and haven't had any real casualties from it. But I'm scared to death going home, not knowing what's waiting on me. Um, you know, of course, I checked them the week before we left and came came out here and. You know, I think I'm sitting around 30 cameras overall, and I mean it's a it's a bad habit, like I think like I think we all have. Yep. And so, um, but being in Kentucky right now, you know, we can we are not a CWD CWD state at the moment, and so you know that we're pretty free on uh, we use. So I've got mineral licks, established mineral licks on a lot of the properties um, that we hunt on, and that makes it easy, you know, and it makes them for some of the best quality trail cam pictures in velvet. And that's why I think a lot of times velvet some, are some of my better pictures, because you know I go out there and put out hundred mm -hmm, pounds of hundred pounds of mineral yearly, and and uh, a couple I usually put I usually do it once in February March, and then July or August again, and then let them set. But you know it's usually the same same spots every year, um, unless we happen to lose a farm, gain a farm, do something different. Those are pretty well established, and and I can usually know what the deer to expect or what I'm looking for. And mm -hmm. so far going in 2019, it's a uh, you know, it's 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 looking pretty good. I'm I'm pretty excited to get back. You know, I missed the Kentucky Velvet opener to be out here. Not that I had uh, anything. I don't not not a lot of my places don't have any grain, so I'm not a, I don't have the best setup for for velvet. Um, but you know, they're still out there, and I usually at least am in a tree on opening day just for tradition's sake. Yeah. Well, 
I would have imagined that this trip may have been slightly different than it has, but, uh, right. that's how it goes sometimes. So you have roughly 30 cameras. How many acres does that cover? Like break that down. Oh, on public. I yes, know you have yes. Some private ground, so. so I keep about, I'd say, five on public right now. You know, and, you know, like I said, the way I treat that public land, um, because I'm I'm blessed to have what I have on the private side. I'm just out there looking for something something special, something big. And so I keep them out there and, you know, um, occasionally you will get those deer. And so if, if it was if it was something special like that I would, you know, maybe steer off of all the but the way the way it's set up for us, you know, we got so much so much energy and time and, and money and food plots and stands and mowing and spraying and, you know, the whole works, the stuff that we love to do, that it doesn't make with with one um one tag in Kentucky for a buck. It doesn't make a lot of sense for me to go to run down to public unless it's something that's really, really special. So, um, so I'd say five of those are on public, and then I've got another three or four out on listings or farms that I have for sale that I'm responsible for. Just trying to get, trying to get, um, you know, something to to show because a lot of those are, you know, those are farms that are going to sell likely to somebody looking for to buy a place to hunt, you know, in Kentucky. And so I've got, you know, several cameras on there, and then the rest of them right now are all on Mineral X, you know. And I'd say that's probably two-thirds of them. Got it. What time do you start switching them off the Mineral X? I, <clears throat> I usually go into scrapes probably, and I like to break it down into basically three phases as far as trail cameras go. But, you know, you got my, my salt licks or, or Mineral X early and then move into scrapes, and that's typically around October 1st. You know, by then I'm usually getting in there hunting a little bit here and there, and I, and I will spend, and I've got you know, six or eight sites already prepped for that switch, you know, when we are in there bush hogging, tilling, mowing, whatever. You know, I go in there and clean out underneath and, and try and, you know, I don't I do not do any kind of special scent or, or rope or any kind of anything like that, but I just kind of make it natural for them. Like, hey, everything's cleared out underneath here. I make even cut some limbs along the edge to make them, you could say, force them or whatever. That's going to be the scrape limb, and my camera's going to be there, you know, just as soon as they basically shed velvet and start switching patterns. Gotcha. How many of those locations do you have? You sh- do you put multiple of those types of scenarios on one parcel, or do you try to make one dedicated area, or is it dependent on the farm? It's dependent on the farm, but most of the time, you know, we've got food plots scattered across the farm, and on each of those plots or areas and corners of the farm, I'll go ahead and do that. So, you know, I'll have one over here, and, you know, a quarter mile or 300 yards or whatever you want, however far you want to say it. It just depends. on. And, and a lot of deer, um, I've kind of gotten – like the one farm that we hunt probably the most, I catch three different circles of deer. If I could show you on a map, home ranges, um, because it's so long and skinny. So I've got some deer at the back, deer at the middle, and deer at the front. And so I've, I've got those set up. And, you know, you know, we're lucky that we've hunted those farms for long enough that I kind of know and I can kind of expect, one, what deer will be there, and two, you know, where to put those cameras. That makes sense. Um, let's see. Hard transition, man. I'm drained. <laughs> I know. <laughs> From I know. I, I'm not in white tail mode, honestly. I'm, I'm, I'm still thinking what we should be doing this afternoon and tomorrow, and what mountain we're going to be climbing, and how many miles we're going to be walking. Right. So something I definitely wanted to discuss was the unique trail camera sets that you've done in the past. Uh, one of them, I would, I would probably give a viral. No, no yeah. Ability. No, it uh, was my, it was by far my best to date, and I'll probably never, <laughs> never top it. And that was the barn buck. So there was a. Um, it looked like an old truck in mm-hmm. an old barn, and you, I'm guessing you bumped a deer and put a camera in there? <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, that's a, that's a farm that we, you know, we still have it, and I put a camera in there every year trying to replicate that, and I cannot, I cannot top those images from, I think that was 2000 and, well, I want to say it was 16, maybe 15, 16, somewhere in there. Um, but, yeah, that was the deer. I was headed up there, putting out, I don't know, it was summertime, I remember specifically jumping that deer out of that barn, you know, he was with a couple smaller bucks, and it just it's just kind of those things when you, a lot of times you see stuff like that, you don't pay attention, and, and I've kind of learned because I, I I like to do these, if I can, um, unique sets or whatever you call them. And when you, see, when you see a deer doing something like that, you know, I can get a camera on that, but it'll make for a cool shot. And so I went in there and leaned up an old uh, beam or board that had fallen down and put it in the right spot, and it took me, it took me actually a couple tries to get it just right because he was bedded bedding up against the wall of that old barn, and I didn't. I never would have imagined that. I kind of put it facing the middle, so I really missed him the first time. 
but then I got it right, <clears throat> and that's when I got the epic pictures. And, and what made that deer, or what made that set cooler than anything else is that was probably 145, 150-inch deer. You know, and he was right up in the camera looking at it, and I had videos, and I had, because I ran it for about a month, and he was in there multiple times. And, and that's what those deer do, um, and every year is different. Um, this year, I mean, I had a camera in there, and, you know, it was nothing but a couple year, you know, year and a half and two and a half year old buck. So it just, after... After that, you know, it just doesn't have quite the the appeal. I mean, I got some quality pictures, but without a, without a big deer, it doesn't it doesn't make it near as appealing. Yeah, and then there was um, some of the other ones. There was one under a, a doe bedded under a camper. <coughs> yeah, yeah, right? we have a got a, an old uh, RV camper parked up there at the cabin. Of course, you know, sometimes not many not many people go up there, so they're pretty pretty relaxed. And it was just a shaded area, and they were bedded underneath there. And similar thing, I saw them under there and thought, well, that'd be cool. So I went and actually grabbed a lawn chair and strapped my camera to the back of the lawn chair and faced it underneath the the RV. And then I got it was a doe, and um, I was probably it was a young year and a half old buck bedding underneath there. So that made for some pretty cool pictures. Um, the other one is I've got a pond that uh, is loaded with wood ducks and for year, every year in and year out. <clears throat> and so I went in there and grabbed some, some actually drug some logs out of the woods because also you learn, I did it just on the water the first time. Well, they would just swim by and that was okay. But I went and drug those logs out and built them up a little place to stand. And they would come just flock right in front of that camera and they stand on that log, you know, like ducks do. And so they would stand there and then after... A few weeks, I actually I actually got a couple of a, of a banded wood duck, um, you know, hanging out right in there. So I think that made some for some pretty cool pictures. And that's that's an early season thing that those those ducks use yearly. But um, just trying to do different stuff. A lot of times, a lot of times, you know, I, that pond after driving by it three and four times and bumping them up every time, it was kind of like, well, they're there. You know, why not try something? So I enjoy looking for things like that and trying to do different things, whether it's different angles or this and that and and uh, that's that's what one, another thing I love about cameras in general, just seeing what you can come up with. Yeah, those are super unique. I think a lot of people probably, it seems, after you got those barn buck pictures, I remember <laughs> seeing some mainstream pictures <laughs> yeah. uh, putting yeah, I've uh, seen set brand few... in, in the barn to do that to try to replicate your image. Yeah. And uh, it hasn't been done. And a lot of those, I mean, they're just extremely unique, and that's that's really cool. Aside from... Because we talked on this podcast, we talked to a, a wide variety of people, people who want to only use them from deer, and then there's also, you know, a mm -hmm. mixture of the two and hobbyists. And I'd probably put you in in the middle of between. Yeah, I have a deer, but yeah, I have a hard time because, you know, I mean, I know I have X amount of salt licks, and I have X amount of cameras that I can put out, and I'm trying to cover X amount of ground, and it makes it hard, you know. But now, you know, after being home, getting a full time job, you know, kind of getting settled, doing these things, I've been able to add to that inventory every year to where I finally got some, you know, flexible cameras or whatever, you know, say some, some, some I can burn or some I can put in unique places and still have my bases cover it for my bucks because that's priority number one. And everything after that is just kind of a, so I always like to try to keep, at this point, I try to keep a couple in the truck or in the, in the, in the little bag there just, just in case I run across something like that. No, that makes sense. Uh, another thing that I wanted to discuss was your Instagram bio says... <laughs> You are the creator of Trophy. Oh Tuesday. my goodness, yes. What is the story behind The claim it? to fame. Or well, how can you back this back that well, statement up? I don't know how many of you know this, but I met Jake. Well, I met never well, we originally got you to meet you. Old school back when Twitter was king. And I don't even know a bunch if, of Twitter pubs. That's right. And I don't know if any of if any of you if any of you uh even remember all that and it feels like it's an eternity like ago 2013, 2014, yeah it was college i mean it was it was i think we were freshmen sophomores in college and um but uh yeah i remember seeing you know that was when i was i had a little i don't know what you call it a little um just outdoor account and it was and you know jake did as well and that like i said that's how we met i think we traded retweets yeah, honestly right. honestly that's yeah. weird as weird as that as weird as it is that that's how you grew and yeah. so so uh you know but i saw somebody i don't remember doing uh I, something you know uh, throwback thursday or whatever you know, say there was it was one of those and i thought well how can i how can i do this and and i thought well that's it and so i did it and and just used hashtag truck on tuesday and that was back in I mean, I was in a school in Missouri then, and, and uh, Instagram was 
Oh, and, uh, if you'd asked me then, I'd have told you Instagram would have never <laughs> taken off. Twitter would always be king. Yeah. That would be the one. And then, you know, now look at it, you're like, well, we we, sh- we definitely did not capitalize on that like we should yeah. have. But that, I claim it. You'd have to go back and search all the way original, you know, go to Twitter and search the so hashtag all the way back to the beginning and see. see. When you typed in the hashtag, you were one of the – you remember being the first, like being the first one. It's, be, it's gonna be, it's there, gonna be or? dang close to the first. It's uh-huh. gonna be dang close. I don't, I, but uh, but I, I claim it anyway. That's fair. I mean, it's funny how those Good. accounts and I guess people like us originally kind of shaped the industry silently in a lot of ways, whether it's like through humor or through various content. Oh yeah, I mean I've still got them and I never use them. But then it's kind of the things we used to, you know. Then I never wanted to do a. A persona or do my own individual i kind of hid behind that 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 was those very generic outdoor accounts that we were growing and pushing those numbers and that's just what we what you what it did back then well it, it, i hit a point i was like well and i was even doing it you know and i think as some of us have done it for other companies you know i mean we did it for a while we ran pages for other companies and got paid for it now if we'd have just i realized if we'd have done it for ourselves in our own individual name we'd probably be way better off yeah it's learn the hard way hindsight but i mean nonetheless <laughs> I had to bring that up. <laughs> well, on the way out here, Cameron's like, did he really search? Well, we'll go back. <laughs> we'll have to go back and look. It'll be on Twitter. It won't be on Instagram. Okay. Okay. So we'll have to go back. And I wonder if you can change that filter to <laughs> oldest. Like the newest t- oldest. Let's scroll oldest forever. Thing. Take a while. Yeah. It's been used a bunch. I bet you on Instagram it's probably been yeah. used. Yeah. I don't know. 30, right. 40,000. Yeah. It's one of the few hashtags I follow, but, you know, claim to fame. Well, I mean, that's that's something. That's <laughs> It's not gonna go away. Like this is the thing. Like, well, I mean, this thing, you know, and everybody, and that's, and I make sure on Tuesday night. That's kind of, I'm always gonna have one. I'm always gonna have one. Doesn't doesn't matter if it's December or November or if it's Tuesday, summer. It's Trail Camp Tuesday. That's right. Um, so let's dive more into some of the tactics that you use. Um, you discuss kind of breaking your cameras off into different segments during different parts of the mm-hmm. season. Um, one question that we typically ask is how often are you checking those, I guess, in the summer, and then how often are you checking them during summer? Oh, I have – I am a bad habit because I check them too much, if you want me to be quite honest. Um, you know, I'm, I know a lot of folks, uh, you know, are using the cell cams. you got the render – the render the render's rolling. And, uh, you know, I'm lucky that I, I live close to most places that I hunt that I'm going to, you know, so I can check those cameras. <clears throat> if, it's a, if it's a Saturday in June and I don't have anything going on, guess where I'm going? And guess where I was the Saturday before? Checking cameras. And so I'll go up there and, and I might limb or move a stand or, or, you know, mow. But then guess what? I'm going to check that camera. So, you know, I really do try to back off of that best I can, you know, once we, especially once we switch to scrapes, you know. Uh, the deer that I'm hunting on most of those farms, you know, you know, I've got several deer that are, you know, five and six that, you know, I'd really like to chase. Well, I kind of, from years past, know where traditionally they should be. So I shouldn't have to go in there, and I don't try to. You know, obviously, it's kind of the thing. If you're going to go to a stand, you want, you're going to check the camera. You know, I do my best to not push the envelope, but I know I do and probably check it more often than I should. But there's nothing that, you know, just gets me more than a camera being dead because I didn't check it or maybe, you know, had it as a limb get in front. Car's, you, you, full. car's full, and you're just aggravated. Like, I could have checked this a week ago and solved this problem, but I didn't. And so that's kind of my bad um have it because I do live close enough that I can just run out there and say, "Hey, let me, let me go see what's back there." Yeah, it's too it's too easy and convenient when you check it and you do get. To yes, yeah, and there are farms. Yeah, there's farms that I haven't been to since. Um, I mean, it's September 15th or so, and it, there's farms I haven't been to since first of August now. But that's not that's just because you know life's been busy and we're out here and and you know if now if I'd have had, you know I know where the deer are that. I'm anticipating trying to chase this year, and I made sure to check those cameras. But you know, I didn't, I didn't have anything on those when I first ran them a couple times in July or June or July. That really, so I, didn't, I haven't, you know, made an extra effort or special trip to go check those cameras. Gotcha. Um, so I guess rolling into the season um, in October, <clears throat> are you going through and trying to keep a schedule, or is it if if you hunt that farm, you kind of check the cameras in the vicinity? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's if, if I'm going to be there, if I'm going to walk by, I'm going to check them. I just, I just have this, but I just cannot stand checking it, well, not walking by without checking it, and that's a bad habit, you know. You know, I think really if you, you know, and I'll say I'll play it differently. You know, if I have a big deer in there that I'm really specifically targeting and he has certain habits or I don't want to bump him, you know, I mean, I'm going to sit there and, you know, plan and look study the maps and i'm going to do it a little differently if 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 i don't have a particular deer in that area or it's close to the road or whatever you want to say 
you know, I'm probably going to check that more often in hopes that something is showing up and I can capitalize on maybe maybe that five to ten day window or, or whatever you say he's there mm-hmm. because, you know, that's <clears throat> this time of year, that time of year, you don't ever really know. I guess with that in mind, when are you tagging most of your bucks year after year? Is it Are you killing rut bucks? Are you killing late October? So the way I try to hunt and try to focus is with all the work that we do, we have a lot of deer year round a lot of food um, early and late deer so I really try to focus on our farms early and late because we have you know the food and we have everything that and all that work to do and then I try to stay out during the rut if I can help it and like I told you earlier it scares me because I'm not there policing my farm and there's nobody there you know not all the time and then that does kind of get to me but during the rut, we do our best to stay out and let our place be a sanctuary, let those deer get through that first week of gun season because that's the heaviest pressure. So we'll bow hunt hard that last week, October, first week of November, then we're gone. So like last year, you know, that's why I went to Missouri. This year I'm going to Oklahoma during that first week. And so that's just try to, you know, I try to plan my hunts specifically like that and then let our farms, you know, rest as much as they can until after because we've got the food and the bed and or whatever you want to say and you know we're, we're protecting those deer best we can because in our area we're trying to get those deer from three to four four is our target um i know in some areas you can you know hope for a little more you know maybe you say i oh, when you watch some of the big shows or whatnot you know five or six is what they're after but if you can get a deer to four and he comes by you better you better take him if that's the deer that you want or if he's on the list because there's no guarantees after that. It seems like that's the – now, we, we, we there are a handful that will squeak through and, and do things different, but that's kind of the, the rule of thumb for us. Got it. Are you gaining a lot of those bucks when you guys are gone? Do they find your farm and stay on it throughout the duration, or do they bounce back off, you know, after that doe isn't hot anymore? Well, I'll tell you, <clears throat> one of my dad's favorite tactics um, and uh, – what he what he does is, you know, we have very high deer density there in western Kentucky. And so what, and like I said, being being CWD free for the moment, you know, we can bait with corn. And he'll go in there and dump piles of corn to keep those does during that first week, during that second week. Basically during the gun season to keep those deer safe or whatever you want to say. Keep them, keep the does there and keep the bucks looking. And so that's kind of a, <clears throat> a tactic that we use to get deer through because we're going we're gonna to be there bow hunting from all, all the way into January. I mean, that's, you know, uh, in 2000 and I guess it would be 16, you know, I, I shot, I missed the deer that I ended up shooting in 2017 with a bow, and it was in January, and we were still in there hunting. And so, you know, that's kind of the way we set our things up. We do our, we do our best to get those deer through. You know, you can't ever, can't ever trust a neighbor usually, and well, it's just part of, I know it's part of it, and that's what happens, and, you know, you got to take it, take what you can get, and that's just, that's how it goes, but we're going to do our best to, to see them through, and then, you know, we've got our list, all right, this is, yes, 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 shoot this, don't shoot these deer, and then go on, and that's just what we, that's how we like to hunt, you know, that's what we get the most enjoyment from. And you do that on pretty much all, all your private farms? Yeah, the yeah, and every farm's a little different, you know, a couple of them are permission farms, and you know, their permission with, hey, you can hunt this, but there's, I mean, I might let, I'm going to let so-and-so deer hunt, you know, family might let so-and-so deer hunt, gun hunt the first three days, and you got it the rest of the year. Or, um, <clears throat> and then there are some farms where we do, and then there are, we, where we do have complete control, and there are some other farms that we share with other folks, you know, and so it's just, it's, everyone's a little bit different. You kind of got to pay attention, and, and the way, the way we like this, you know, we're looking for that, I'm, I'm looking for that big deer. I'm running those cameras. I'm looking for, for the deer that's going to keep me up at night keep me thinking about and that's the deer i'm going to spend my year chasing and i'd rather go down swinging um chasing that one particular deer that i have a history with than than fill that tag on something that you know isn't isn't there doesn't mean anything to me yeah you're i I guess talking with you more in depth during this trip is you're very specific about age class and hunting specific deer, mm-hmm. probably yes. more than, than most people. I think a lot of people just hunt a caliber of deer and not necessarily so concerned about the, the age class. Mm-hmm. So Yeah. And that deer, like even that deer I, and sh- I did shoot in 2017, I missed it in 2016. That deer, you know, I had him for three. He was a five-year-old. I had um, his set from three, one from one side from four. I had four or five encounters before I finally was able to get him into range and, and seal the deal. And so... You know, but that deer, and he, honestly, he's going to score in the probably 30s. But he has a lot of character. I had a lot of time and energy wrapped up in that deer. And you can bet I'm going to mount him. I mean, that's that deer meant more to me than 
than than most of the, a lot of the other deer I've killed because you know I had so much time and energy wrapped up in that in that pursuit and and that's what I enjoy and it and like I said you know that's that is where we spend our time and our extra money and and that's what we that's the enjoyment we get out of it yeah it's definitely full season approach we uh we just had a gust of mountain wind come through so if there's a little bit of background noise wind chime <coughs> That's what happens when you're I don't know, <laughs> not complaining. I think it's 95 at home, and we're sitting out here in, in pullovers and, and pants and then freezing. The one that we camped was 27. Yeah, frost on the ground. We, we, were, we were snuggling in the tent. <laughs> you guys were. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think that is really interesting. Something that I wanted to ask is why we have you on here, too, is if someone was looking for a lease or le- looking for a piece of ground, what are some of the cliff notes on what you suggest people to look at on a, on a top level that maybe they wouldn't think of initially? Yeah. Well, you know, like I said, I'd say a good portion of what we hunt, honestly, is leases. And, you know, that is just by having a good reputation um, in the community, being out there, talking to folks constantly, and being, you know, having the job that I have, I am constantly talking to folks, and that just that just comes with it. But, you know... We have, you know, we try to, keep, you know, a good reputation for taking care of things. You know, we always are doing our best. You know, I've put, we've put up, you know, no telling how many private property, no trespassing signs, no telling how many gates, you know, just trying to do, th- you know, keeping farms mowed for them, you know, just, you know, our own time, our own money, just trying to keep that good relationship with those landowners because in the end, that's that's who's deciding whether you're getting to keep that piece or not or whether they're going to charge you more or not. So, you know, the approach that we take is, hey, we're local. You know, we, we take care of things. We're going to do things right. We're going to we're not just going to go out here and just you know sling bullets across the the countryside like like you know hunters in general do have kind of a reputation for, and <clears throat> and so you know that's kind of our approach. And we'll say, hey, you know, we're in this for a long term deal. We want to manage folks. And so so if what I'm saying is if you want to do those things and you do want to take this approach, you just kind of really just need to be you know knocking on doors, talking to folks. There's no doubt going to be turnover. You get a lot of folks coming from different states, coming to hunt. You know, I go to different states. People are coming from my state and a lot of them from, from down south. And um, just, you know, because Kentucky and a lot of my clients are that way as well because Kentucky's an easy, uh, it's an easy drive from down south. Over-the-counter tags, you know, you're hunt, you can hunt from September to January. And so mm-hmm, you can velvet, you can late season, you got the rut, you know. And the only thing that keeps us having big deer or saves us is that one buck tag. But, you know, if you're trying to find a lease, um, specifically in your area, you know, like I said, I would just be out there constantly talking to people. You know, somebody says this and that, and you never know when somebody might be giving up a farm because they're tired of driving six hours or maybe they have a better opportunity or, you know, things are constantly changing in people's lives. And that's why farms change hands, whether it's a sale or a lease. And, you know, we're always looking. And, and honestly, once we've gotten a hold of the ones we've gotten a hold of, we've never let them go. I mean, if we can at all help it, um, we keep them regardless because – <clears throat> they are very hard to get, especially ones of any quality. And so you kind of really got to keep that rapport and keep working with every, you know, whoever it is that's in charge and kind of keep them informed and do what you can for them. Mm-hmm. Would you say that the best leases you found are off-market deals and not Oh, 100%. 100%, you know, just um, really have come through local like local folks that, that know us and that know people and have said, hey, you know, I've heard so-and-so was thinking about, you know, leasing their farm, and then nobody's hunted it for X amount of years, or, or you know, and then a couple have come to me from, you know, just friends saying, hey, you know, maybe we're thinking about letting that one go if you have an interest in it, and I might say, okay, well, you know, we'll see what we can do, and, <clears throat> you know, we have a lot of folks that do come hunt with us, and then we do have some farms where we are less strict, and we might, you know, say, hey, you know, we'll take that, and we'll bring in somebody else, and, you know, try to get it all worked out to where other people can hunt it, and that makes it cheaper for us, and I'll tell you another thing, being the big deer hunters that we are, we give up a lot of the turkey rights. You know, if we can find somebody to pay for half the lease to, to, to turkey hunt or even a third of it, that allows us to go get another deer lease potentially. You know, because, you know, we have, we, we, you know, you have that budget on what you want to spend. And so, so we've done that on several farms. So when turkey season rolls around, it's tough because, I mean, well, I mean, it's, 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 it's hard because I, I can't just run up there to the farms I'm used to running to. So I'm, I'm hunting public during turkey season just as much as anything. And there's a lot of it in Kentucky. We'll say there's a fair amount. We're not going to get it's crazy with it. No, no, not at all. Um, got it. So, and then also, <laughs> I guess, would you, for someone that's looking to buy a farm, 
potentially their first farm. Yeah. What are just a couple of quick advice? Because I think everyone, that's everyone. Oh, and yes. Well, and that's how I got into this, you know. I mean, like I said, you know, my dad is, uh, you know, he's in wildlife management, and I've grown up doing around these kind of things, doing these kind of things, um, and that's really where my interests come from, you know, and we leased forever and ever, and my whole end goal, and the whole reason I kind of got into this, or whatever you could say, is, is because I wanted my own farm one day down the road, you know, and I think I'm, I think like we all, we're all working closer towards that goal to be able to manage and grow and do what we want to do um, with our own land, because, you know, when you lease, you know, if, uh, you know, they decide to change something, sell you know, farm. sell the farm, whatever, well, you're just... There's nothing you can do about it. It's not your, it's not your ground. And so that's so in the end, I mean, that is what we're all aiming for, striving for, and we've been able to do that a little bit, but we're not where we want to be. Um, so really what I would say is realistically I get a lot of folks in Kentucky. You know, I'm just going to – I'll get into land for a second here. You know, 2,000 an acre is kind of that, that ballpark, which is relatively cheap compared to some of the other Midwestern states where big farming um, has run those prices up. Um, but, it, you know – you look at that, a lot of the budgets, a lot of time people are saying about 150000 or less. And why? Because they can afford that on a monthly payment. They're not able to pay cash on a monthly payment. So if it's me, you know, you got 150000 to spend, let's say you do, you know, I would rather be able to do that in smaller chunks because that gives you, you know, rather than buying the biggest piece you can buy and not knowing who your neighbors are, what you're going to be able to do, you know, if you ha if you can bust that it up into two seventy five thousand dollar pieces you know you've got two different places to hunt with two different deer herds with two two different sets of neighbors you know you might have a good deer here this year you might have a good deer here next year um now you're probably going to play a little more price breaker but and also let's say you know if times get hard money gets you know you need to you need to move but you don't have to sell the whole farm you can sell one of the two and you know you can always flip move do things like that and that's the way i see a lot of you know Traditionally, you've seen a lot of these big farms. They keep getting busted up and busted up and busted up. And now we're getting down to where 50 and 30, 30 to 50 to 75 acre parcels. I mean, that's pretty common. It's a lot of what I deal with. And not a lot of it are folks that are looking, you know, to do exactly what we're doing. They want to have that piece of ground that they own, that they can manage, that they can take care of. And, and I know you can't keep it here or, you know, on 35, 50, even 100 acres. I mean, we know what their home range, how big it is. But, you know, that gives you more opportunities and, uh, but there's there's a lot of, uh, you know, the Internet has changed everything in, in that game. And so those those resources are out there. You know, the best thing you can do is probably just talk to lots of locals and agents in the area, kind of figure out, you know, who has a <clears throat> who has a uh, who's experienced and who has the knowledge of what you're looking for. Um, you know, if it's big deer or if it's, you know, I get a lot of folks that are just saying, hey, I just want to have a place to, you know, yeah, hunting's important, but it's not the main thing. I want to have a place to come get away, whether it's on the, to camp or on the lake or just, you know, shoot. A lot of people like shoot guns. I get a lot of people saying, hey, I just want some acres so I can go shoot. Okay, well, we can do that too. And so you just kind of got to look at it for what's important to folks and, and help them. But, yeah, that the Internet has changed it all. There are several land sites and, and, and uh, even residential sites. Most of them are listed on there as well. And so just do your homework, talk to folks, and if you have a specific area in mind, you can go up there and just spend some time with it talking to folks and, and seeing what you can come up with. Yeah, I guess to summarize, off-market deals, whether you're buying yeah. or leasing, are obviously usually the best best case scenario, but uh, I guess working with Yeah, you. best case, yeah, that's the best case. It's not, not always the case, but, you know, every now and then there are, I do get some pieces that, that hit the market and they go just like that, and that's yep. just... You know, they haven't, you know, and that's what people are, I mean, they're sitting there waiting for, the right for that email notification. Hey, it hit the market. All right. And then they're, they're calling me or they're doing this or doing that and they're ready to go. And that's almost how you have to be today. Yeah, absolutely. Um, anything else you want to cover here? I know kind of jumped around somewhat. Yeah. And <clears throat> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think call? the altitude <laughs> has uh, taken a toll on me, I believe. It doesn't help. We, I th we're, what, what are we at? Day 7, 75, least, 70 seven, miles. 70 is a so, yeah, somewhere around that mark, and we've got another two or three days left to, to, to add to it. Hit a hard and head to higher elevation, I think, in different I don't areas. Know. Well, just, just to sum it up, we, we drove out here to chase bugle and elk, and now we're sitting here deer hunting elk, which is not the – not what you dream of. No, it's not. Well, not why we came. Not not why we picked this week. Not why we came to do this. We know we hope to hear on bugling and, and do everything like you see it on TV. But it has been far from that. Yeah, I knew it was gonna be. I knew it was gonna be challenging. But oh yeah. The other flip flip side of it is like 
I'll, I'll being out here for ten days, like you think you would be able to trick a satellite bull <laughs> over ten days. You know, or running, yeah, just find that one bugling bull. But yeah. it, it seems like uh, you know, even some of the folks you talked to said this has been one of the weirdest, hardest, different years. Of course, that's the year we picked to try to come out here. Yeah, I guess I guess it's only up from here. <laughs> I sure hope so. Um, real quick though, where can everyone find you if they would like to? All right, so just uh, social media is everything's just Reese Johnson Seven, and that's Reese spelled just like the candy bar. Uh-huh. Yeah, and then and then uh, same thing goes for for the land. You know, if you just type in, uh, you can go to kwland.com and then just Reese Johnson. You can see all my all the farms that I have for sale or. You know, I do my best to, to advertise and be all over the place. I feel like my phone number is everywhere, and I get all kinds of crazy calls from different states. A lot of them real, a lot of them not. Yeah. And so that's just uh, that's part of part of the gig, part of it. <clears throat> but, yeah, if anybody, you know, if they ever want to talk deer hunting or any questions for what it's worth, I'll be happy to do it because that's what, in the end, that's why a lot of people call me. You know, they're looking for that dream farm, and that builds a lot of relationships with, with folks that, you know, whether they buy or sell with me or not, you know, that's how I've met a lot of good folks. And then through social media as well, that's how, honestly, yeah. I've met a lot of my best hunting buddies anymore. Yeah, and I, I will say you are a generous person just hearing you talk about inviting other people up to your guys' farms to, you know, shoot a buck that necessarily doesn't mean much to you, but it would mean a lot to yeah. them. I, I do it I do my best I mean I, I get <clears throat> not gonna lie I mean I mean I'm definitely after my one or two deer but I do my best to try to say hey you know come on and and uh, we'll put you on something and, and as long as you don't shoot a three-year-old we're good <laughs> all right well thank you Reese and I appreciate uh, it. hopefully we'll have a we'll, we'll have an, hopefully podcast. we'll have an, an update with <laughs> with something something on the to take home from this trip for sure well well thank you once again for sitting down yeah I well, appreciate it